I would like to introduce you, uh, first of all, to our first uh, speaker, uh, Professor Charles Amjad Ali. Uh, Charles is a friend of a long time and he's been with us for a few days already at the university. He's a long time friend uh, and comrade and colleague of mine. Uh, he teaches at uh, Luther uh, College in the United States. Um, he's an Anglican or Presbyt an Episcopalian, is that what they call in the United States? He's an Episcopalian uh, minister, an intellectual who's written uh, very many books, and um, I don't know, but I'm very keen to find out if this is a record. It's the craziest figure that I've heard. Um, has had 85, 83, 83 <laughs> doctoral uh, students that he had supervised successfully. I don't know how, where, you know, I've never found the equivalent of this. Um, um, and Charles has been a leading figure um, in the Christian intellectual world, in liberation theology debates, um, in the struggle to transform the church, but also in the field of uh, Muslim-Christian relations. I hesitated a bit to say that um, because this Muslim-Christian relations always invoke uh, images of dialogue and people cuddling each other and uh, show and tell, you know. You come along and say how good Christianity has been for women and I come along and I say how good Baha'ism has been for women and somebody else comes and says Judaism and we all have a nice cup of tea and we go happily home and we live happily ever after. Charles has never been a part of that uh, project. He's every bit committed to the idea um, that peace is the outcome of struggles for justice. Um, and so it's more about interfaith solidarity. S served his time in the prisons of Pakistan for his own opposition to dictatorships and so on. Has had a long uh, intellectual uh, history with us. So if the other two speakers uh, don't mind uh, my uh, long attention uh, to Charles, uh, they, uh, um, in, uh, in Urdu we say, uh, that uh, the chicken that you eat at home is the equivalent of lentils. You know, lentils is the ordinary people's food, and perhaps at the time when this expression was coined, uh, chicken was still a luxury to be having. Uh, the other two speakers that we have is uh, Rodney Chaka, um, who is uh, from UNISA, um, a uh, professor there, and Maria, um, who is, and Rodney is, has been making a major contribution to South African, and we're very careful about these terms in South Africa, we have liberation theology, we have contextual theology, uh, and we have black <coughs> theology. Uh, Rodney has been a consistent uh, advocate of black theology. There are a number of survivors left from that period, uh, including uh, Shahid Mati, uh, who until now refuses to embrace the new ethos of um, an, an ANC uh, hegemony, a eh? kapfas in, uh, in his corner where he is. And Rodney is one of those people, so we're keen to listen to you a little bit later in the day. And then uh, we have uh, Maria, who is uh, um, officially a postdoctoral fellow in our department. I say officially because she wears many other hats, uh, um, both in the department and outside. Maria is also an Episcopalian uh, minister, an Anglican minister. And uh, Maria has until recently been the registrar of uh, St. Augustine's. St. Augustine's is the one uh, theological institute in South Africa that also offers training and studies up to the level of the PhD. So if you will uh, join me in offering a warm welcome to our... Uh, Charles, it is over to you to open uh, the discussions for us with your presentation. And your presentation, Charles, is uh, um, 
world Christianity. Uh, world Christianity and the shifting emphasis of the church in today's world with an emphasis on Christian encounters with Islam. Farid, I mean, uh, listening to you talk before the introduction, I, uh, my first work was in, 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 in philosophy and social thought. And one of the questions was precisely this nature, that what knowledge game is about, you know, the, what they call the epistemic questions. And the Germans actually, and I mean, you were mentioning, because I was studying with the man who openly admits to the prejudice, was Gadamer. So, and Hans Georg Gadamer would say, ah, prejudicum, everybody is prejudiced. And he was reworking the, the, this. And I'm saying this is the base on which this text is written, that there is clearly a prejudgment that I bring to my presentation. And anybody who claims that they don't have presentation, they have worth fry, to be value free is not to be human. So, I mean, let me put this, you can fight with me afterwards. We are all having a value system, whether we like it or we know it. We learn it from a mother's womb and we learn it in the culture. You know, why is you know, your, your children growing up Muslim? Because that's a cultural thing. That's, say that. But even within knowledge game itself, the Germans made three sciences, right? We made them in different ways. The Geisterwissenschaften, the Sozialwissenschaften, and the Naturwissenschaften. They were all Wissenschaften. The, the difference was what adjective you add to that knowledge game. What we have done is we have made natural science science and everything else falls off. Yeah. Right? I mean, so the distinction and those of us who came out of these, uh, you know, the late 60s and early 70s education, we made a distinction between explaining and understanding. And Unterschied zwischen verstehen und erklärung. What does a scientist do? H2O, I explain. I don't do anything with it. This is two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. It makes water. I decontaminate myself and I go into the laboratory and make it. But for Wissenschaften, which are dealing with social and guys, we accept the fact that we begin with the contaminated humanity. <laughs> and anybody who claims they're going to go into the laboratory, much as they like, the contamination is going to seep in. So we then begin asking different levels of questions. And I'm, I'm saying that because that's a context of the paper I'm giving you. Uh, and I think this is a very important epistemological question that where is this question, whether it's a clarum or it's explanation. Am I explaining to you something that you have to take or not take? Or are you willing to stand under it? The preposition that stand before the stand is first stay in. And makes a big difference between the two thoughts. I just wanted to give that because of your context of the conversation. Uh, to be value free, I mean, you're claiming divinity for yourself. I mean, how many anybody can say they're value free? You know, so I just, and I'm saying that is a very laboratory minded understanding. So I go with that and begin. Um, my preface, but Rodney, uh, Rodney and I just shared a little history together. We were both in New Jersey for a long period of time. I mean, you know, not one of the most beautiful states on God's <laughs> earth, but we loved it there for whatever reasons. And Maria and, and we had dinner together, and, and, and she's an Anglican. I mean, you know, there's a prejudice that I have, you know, we mixed her immediately. So I'm very happy to have both of you as part of my discourse here. There are many social movements which shape and reshape the world in almost every generation. There's not one movement and therefore one change. Every generation experiences changes and differently. And those who live in South Africa, I mean, I came here in 92. This generation has seen changes that you could not dream of. In 92, if somebody had told me that apartheid would be over in 94, I would have said, you're dreaming, my brother. And if you remember, that time Shell was promoting discussions on post-apartheid South Africa. Do you remember those days? When we were struggling still in this question. And two years later, it collapsed. And, and I think people were caught unawares at the level of collapse that how quickly that thing went. I mean, 1989, how quickly that thing went in, in Soviet. So, I mean, the change happens much more than... We, at the point, the role of the intellectual is to look about the continuity and change both very seriously. And the dialectic is what makes knowledge move. I, so one of the problems is we, we either emphasize exclusively change and don't look for continuity, or we emphasize continuity and don't want change at all. And it's this dialectic, actually, that makes history move, you know, to, if I can use that Hegelian nonsense. But 
So, <laughs> so, and especially after Fukuyama, <laughs> the end of history because the Soviet Union is gone. Therefore, there's no longer any history. So, and I think amongst these changes, one of the major changes is migration and globalization are clearly some of the most significant ones. And I'm not because I'm living in America where all everybody is a migrant. <laughs> of one kind or the other. The local people are all dead. You know, so, so, so one is, and it is a hot debate. As a transnational economic, political, and cultural exchange, migration and globalizations were already operative among others in the Persian, and the Greek Hellenes, the Muslim Arabs, and the Turks, with their various cities, cosmopolises. However, the present migration and globalization have their roots around the end of the 15th century and reached its zenith a few centuries later, seen, formed, and informed by a European migration and a European universalization, the globalization that took place. The beginning of that people date, and I think they dated right, is 1492, when Christopher Columbus crossed over the Atlantic, thought he was going to India. I, I made a joke about it. Those people are still called Indian 500 years later because he thought he was in India. You know, I mean, this is, this is knowledge. This is abstract knowledge. Right? So, so I, and I jokingly said, you know, we survived because they didn't come to India at the time. Like if they had, then we might have been all dead. So, so, you would not have had a Kerala. <laughs> but it's actually very important that in the, in the same period, national and international migration both forced the voluntary, both forced and voluntary, there was actually forced migration like into Australia. There were political prisoners who were sent to penal colonies. And people forget that part, that this actually was a migration that took place from the Irish who were resisting the English. And they were sent to, uh, to Australia as penal colonies. So they did not migrate by their own choice. They were sent there as a part of rehabilitation. So there's forced migration that was happening. It was also a forced migration when you take the slavery from West Africa into the Americas. It was not that they were not migrants. They did not have a choice. So when they sat in Mayflower, something they left and migrated with choice, whereas there were people who were forced to migrate under no choice at all. And that part, we don't look at it very carefully, what that means. The International Organization for Migration estimate that they are nearly about today 200 million migrants worldwide, with the greatest number of them residing in Europe now, followed by North America and then Asia. But if we go just a few centuries back, then Europe was the most migratory re region, which spread and took over the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, parts of Africa, and even Asia. There are more Irish that live outside than all the Irish put together in both the islands five times as many, according to the estimates that they make. I mean, I'm not making my own, I'm just giving you the numbers, right? <coughs> so, uh, all this has a serious impact on Christianity and manifests it itself in many diverse ways. This, these were Christian migrants at the time, right? So, you, that they actually make an impact. She copied that both and I said my second page is missing. <laughs> While numerous studies have been conducted on the economic, political, social, and cultural impact of globalization and, margin, and mi migration respectively, only recently Christian theologians have turned their attention to the implication of these two movements jointly of migration and, and globalization. That we have talked about globalization, we have talked about migration, but we have not seen how the two actually work themselves out and what are the implications of that for Christian theology. As I said in the earlier class that all three monotheistic religions are basically migratory religions. And we don't, haven't paid attention. And the migration is between Asia and Africa and not into Europe. Right? Moses migrated from Africa into Asia. Jesus migrated from Asia into Africa. And Muslim, the first migration was to Abyssinia. The, 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 these are migratory religions. And that has not been part of our, you know, you've done theology. How many times you've done any theology of migration? That, and so this actually, uh, I bring it up, and that has implication for world Christianity, which has not been articulated. Because we still see Christianity as rooted out of a European context. Whether it's missionary enterprise or theological enterprise, it is basically European-centered. So all of us have to fulfill the grammar that we learn out of an bath or a telech or, a, or a, if you're Protestant and if you're a Catholic, you have to go to whether you go to Kurana or you go to Kong or whoever you want to go to. 
So the referential point still remains. And, 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 and that forces us to consider whether there may be globally a Christian church, but theologically there is not. And that, I think, is where the rub is now coming in theological points. So when we talk about world Christianity, finally there is now a recognition, and this does not come out of theological schools, but it comes out of missiological schools, because they're concerned about what's happening out there. Remember, ecumenism was not born out of the, seminar, out, out of the theological faculty. It was created out of the mission concern. I hated him because he was a Presbyterian and I was a Lutheran when we were in America together. Now we are in South Africa and there are other people. And so what do we say? We have to eat and drink together. Ecumenism was born in mission fields. And that's why 1910 Edinburgh becomes the paradigmatic ecumenical founding moment. And it was done by 1700 missionaries. No theologian was allowed. They said theology divides, mission unites. That actually was the rhythm. So I just want to give you that heritage that the global Christianity as it begins to emerge, begins to emerge out of these mission fields because also concern for other religion and first primarily to convert better. I was more efficient if I knew everything about Islam then I can do this. So missionary enterprise became like anthropology became for the colonial power. I hope you know that anthropology is a colonial science. It was set up in Britain primarily expert way of dominating and ruling the colonized people. So SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, was created out of that concern. And missionaries began to set up religion studies out of that context. Too. So to understand that they were all beginning to study, but not because I wanted to understand Farid, it is because I was trying to convert Farid. <laughs> I didn't care about you as such. So it was basically to target better. And that is, was part of the world Christianity is still imaged itself as coming out of a monoculture, mono-religious world into the worlds where there were other religions, but we have to undermine those religions as a part of our process, right? So that's, that's the context of this world Christianity debate that has emerged. This expression refers to the fact that today Christianity no longer has a predominantly Western character, but is steadily becoming truly a world religion, which was its claim from Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. The first time it really is talking about the end of the earth, really. Not as an extension or emanational extension, if I can use a Gnostic term. So, uh, so this Catholicity, uh, which has been the hallmark of Christianity, has been intensified by globalization and migration like nobody expected. The recent massive demographic, dem demographic shifts of Christians from the global North, Europe and North America, to the global South Africa, Asia and Latin America, has changed how we should perceive Christianity, though this has not always produced a requisite epistemological shift. So we, are, we realize that Christianity is much larger present in Africa than it ever was, but it has not changed how we go about doing the theological task. And this is where, Rodney, what you are doing, and the black theologian, and all of a sudden you put conditions on it that this has never been an objective theology. It's the theology which is produced out of certain prerequisite requirements. So the recent, uh, this, this thing, uh, uh, these factors have radically transformed the face of Christianity, shaped not only by the diverse Christianities, which are now emerging all over the globe, but also by the migrant diverse cultures and religions that live with us. So if I live in, in a city, which is altogether the whole state is four and a half million people, and my largest suburb included is about 1.8 million people. We have got every religious community living in an area which is primarily Scandinavian. When I went to the university the, to teach at Luther Seminary, 1997, do you know everybody in my class, I had 67 people taking my introduction to theology course, Everybody was blonde and blue-eyed, not just white, because they're all Scandinavian Lutheran, you understand? <laughs> so they were all really, there was one woman with dark hair. So I said, so where do you come from, Maria, like you? Oh, she said, and she said, very apologetically, my mother is Irish. Oh, my, but my father is Norwegian. <laughs> apologetically, she had to say that I have dark hair because somewhere we got mixed up. Otherwise, I would have also had blonde hair. <laughs> And it's a very Scandinavian school. I hope you know this is a Norwegian, Scandinavian, you, you've been in that area. So th this understanding of Christianity, that it is tied to ethnicities, tied to regionalism, is now beginning to completely 
be undone. However, epistemologically, it is still, those of us who do this work find great amount of resistance in, in, in that work. I mean, incredible amount of resistance. So the academy, which is what you were talking about, that's why I'm saying I'm bringing up with the, would say, well, you know, you're not doing theology. So everybody who does not do theology this way is given a genitive preposition. So it's a feminist theology, it's black theology, it's liberation theology. We do theology. Ours is the objective theology. Yours is all the subjective, peripheral, not kosher, if I can use a term that we, halal. <laughs> so, so, so that becomes, a sorry. So it's like you get people. Yeah. And then you get people of color. Color. <laughs> that, <coughs> yes, exactly. And whites are people. I know. All others are people of, of color. color. <laughs> and same thing in my seminary. We who are non-Lutherans are called ecumenical faculty. Everybody else is, is a, I mean, and I say, are you not ecumenical? Why are you teaching in a seminary? Oh, no, no, we ask them, then why don't you call yourself? Because they have to put a designation of difference into this whole thing. We do this, right? So we actually put a genitive clause on these things. And I mean, the, the argument is, as I keep saying this, the, the theology that we learned, I mean, I learned all these big boys were as genitive as anything else, but they were not called genitive white theology. So I call it white theology now, you know, <laughs> white privilege theology, and this, that just discards them. They said, no, you can't call it. I said, why can't I call it? You call me my theology, liberation theology, his theology. Why can't I call it white privilege theology? So I just turned the table on them. So whenever I give a lecture at this seminary, I call it white privilege theology, which is what it is then. Okay, so I'm just saying this. So uh, Globalization and migration have affected all religious communities, not only Christianity. Remember that right now there are 28% more Muslims living in non-Muslim areas. I mean, in my city, we have got seven mosques. I mean, I attend and work and live with. And those seven mosques are the ones that openly are there. There are other all who are not still willing to. So they meet on Friday, but they don't say that this is a mosque, you know, so it looks like they're coming for dinner or something. <laughs> and especially after September 11th, we, you, you don't want to go in a suburbia and have a mosque because they're going to blow it up, right, or something. So the, all religions are affected, including ancient traditions of Asia and Africa today. Hinduism has not been a missiological religion. It's a migratory religion. It has not converted people, but it has migrated out. So it actually creates community out of migration and attrition from that migration. Whereas the religions that produce multi-ethnic global communities are primarily Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. The three missiological religions. Hinduism and certain traditional African religions are produced by actually migratory community wanting to get together. And I think this is one of the things that we, while all religions of the world are expecting, experiencing the effect of migration and globalization, the impact is especially significant for Christianity and Islam. Any discussion of world Christianity will therefore have to focus on multicultural, multi-religious context as central epistemological element for a theological vocation and the theological enterprise. And I use the word enterprise not as a capitalist. So it's not making a firm and making profit out of it. But an enterprise is the effort conduct, uh, taken to do something new. Right? So uh, I'm saying, please... You cannot any longer do theology as if to say you're living in a monocultural context. This does not exist even in Europe. It hasn't existed for a long time now. I mean, please understand, a Germany that you mentioned has got 7% Muslim population. And these are not actual nat naturalized Germans. They are what they call the Gastarbeiters. More people worship on Friday than they do on Sunday. I just want to give you this. All over Western Europe, more people are in worshipping community on Friday than they are on Sunday. That's not because they're not calling themselves Christian. They just don't go to church. I mean, a, where a Muslim who feels threatened has to go to mosque as a part of the identity marker as well as security factor. Right? So they actually, so you understand this, this context of this minorityness produces loyalties and allegiances which may not exist outside of that context. You know, a Turk may never want to talk to Arab for, for reasons that you, if you remember, right? But when they get to Germany or England, they're very good friends. 
So I said this, unlike the largely mono-religious context of theology, which emanated from the 16th to the 20th century from the European, this is not global reality we experience. We experience everywhere such that even Euro-American theologians are equally involved in this enterprise, though the level of power between the minority and the major com majority community may be quite different. So that what we do in communities like in Pakistan or something is that you live out of fear. You, 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 when you were there, you know what I'm talking about, especially when you were there. So, but the point is our enterprise is, is dialogical. When I do it is, this in America, we are actually condescending on the Muslim community largely. We are being nice to you. <laughs> so, you know? Whereas in Pakistan, my own life is at stake as being a Christian. And so the, 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 both of them begin with the religious communities, but they begin from a different position and different perspective. And you know the Coptic Christians in Egypt. I mean, they're right now undergoing all kinds of, and they are now sitting with a state which is a totally non-democratic state because they were scared of what Akhwan Muslimin is going to do to them. So I'm just saying that they're dialogue, but they're different contexts of this dialogue. So don't make it all sit down, and as you said, in this huggy-feely good. <laughs> it's not as huggy-feely and good as you would like it to be. And, and Germans have a constitutional requirement for religious instruction. I hope you know this. Actually, the constitution written under the American dictate brought together a religious instruction in the high school. I think part of Scandinavia has those, that you have to have in high school a religious instruction. I, I don't know if you know this. Mm -hmm. Very, very critical point, because now there are 33 school districts which are majority Muslims. And I was a part of that discussion at the Deutsche Institute of Pedagogy of Ocean. They invited me for three years running to talk about this because the Article 6 of the Constitution says that the state will provide instruction in religious education to the students and doesn't say it is Christian. Religious instruction. And now all of a sudden when they were writing this, they were assuming Catholics and Protestants. They had no idea there was going to be anybody else, right? And all of a sudden, in order to construct this new Europe, which had lost all its manpower, they had to import labor. Remember this, this, is, this, is, this migration was not done as, as only a benefit to the migratory community. It was done to the migratory, the, the state you migrated in. England was destroyed, Germany was destroyed, France was destroyed. And the very people who provide the middle income were dead or handicapped. So this new immigrant provided actually the new impetus for the creation of what is now Europe. They created industry, they built roads, they did everything. And yet they are as less citizens and they provided income tax. You know? And I, I say to my American friends, look, I was not benefiting from the American school system. You know, which costs you $18,400 a year. And you've got 12 years of schooling. Then what I do is when I earn my money, I give tax and recover that $18,400 they had given me. So it becomes this continuous paying back and forth out of the system. I didn't go through a school system. I went to the university and immediately became a tax-paying citizen. So you have not invested any money on me, and I am a taxpayer, which is what you were talking about, that you are a tax. So the immigrant community causes a series of questions and series of myths and series of prejudices. And I'm saying, it's, and if you have a Muslim community after September 11, this becomes further tense. So in Germany, the question is, what do we do with these Muslim students? Do we give them religious instruction? Then the argument came from the state, but they're not qualified to teach. Whereas a priest in the Catholic church can do catechesis. And a Protestant pastor is spent five years, seven years, depending on magisterium or magistrar or, or you do, your, has got five, seven years. These people who are going to come and do instruction for the Muslim students in their school system are not qualified. So my proposal was to the state that why doesn't those states in which these 33 districts are provide educational <coughs> possibilities on every other level they can be like any other teacher, and then they can learn the Islam from the madrasa level, so that you combine the two systems and make it work. And that proposal actually was implemented. I stayed there from the, after I left. I, I don't know if you know. After I left center, I was in Germany for two, uh, at the University of Frankfurt and Freiburg, and helping with this issue. So, so I'm not talking about these in soft ways because these are issues that are impacting lives of the people. Uh, briefly looking at some of the major shifts in Christian history. 
it is obvious this Christianity has spread far from its historical origin. Please, that Christianity was world Christianity at a much large, earlier period than it was acknowledged. And let me give you some hint. Everyone knows this historical thing, but let me just revive your memory into it. Christianity began in the Middle East and North Africa. It's not called a Middle Eastern religion. Okay. Yeah, okay. You know the time? Okay. okay, okay. Uh, today, that region has both the lowest concentration of Christians, about 4% of the region's population, the whole region's population, the only 4%, and the smallest number of Christians, about 13 million, bulk of whom are in Egypt, about 8 plus million. So this region, which was completely Christian, produced the best church, church fathers, produced our the religious foundations is no longer a Christian area. And that puts an ironical question, and I'll come to that in a while, okay? Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world, is a home to more Christian than the 20 countries in the Middle East put together. So Indonesia is not only a big Muslim country, it has also got the largest number of Christian when you go back to the origins of Christian places. It's very interesting that part to look at. <coughs> Nigeria now has more than twice as many Protestants than Germany does. Now, I mean, how do you deal with this? This is the Reformation period. There are Protestants. There are less Ge Protestants in Germany than there are in, in Nigeria. Brazil has more than twice as many Catholics as Italy. And C Italian Catholic, that's why the Pope was there, the first thing where Francis went. All the Christian comprise just under a third of the world's people they form a majority population in 158 countries. Now, how do you work that in? You understand what I said? Because they, the, the, these, are, these are by birth, right? I mean, I'm not talking about this confessional, you know, that I became, I was born again. I'm talking about Christians who were born into Christian family and call themselves Christian, right? So th these are some of the statistics that are changing. And are, we have a... Christians have increased by fourfold, and this is a very interesting statistic. That in 1910, this conference took place, which is a founding conference, and 2010 was a 100-year celebration. There were two celebrations that was done in 2010. One was a social gospel, which is Rauschenbusch, which was then seen as, as not Christian, who was a Baptist pastor. And the other was the Edinburgh Conference. And so in 2010, we celebrated two festivals. And because of that, there was statistics done what has happened between 1910 and 2010, right? I mean, I hope you know that because that was a core foundational meeting. And so I'm going to read you this. Christians have increased by four folds over the last hundred years from about 600 million in 2010, 1910 to more than 2 billion in 2010. Although this is a substantial growth over the last hundred years, due to the world's overall population growth, from an estimated 1.8 billion to 6.9 billion, Christianity make up a little smaller proportion of the world population than it did in 2010, in 1910. You understand that? It has fourfold multiplied, but the population is multiplied larger than that. And so there, in fact, what has happened is that the, the proportion, proportion presence of Christianity has dropped from 35 to 32% of the world's population, which is a large chunk when you take 6.9 million people. You know, 3% is a very large number of people. A century ago, this was not the case. According to the historical estimate made by the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, in 1910, at the time of the Great Conference on Mission, about two-thirds or 67% of the world's Christian lived in Europe. 67% of the world's Christians just lived in Europe. And this is already by about 40, 50 years of mission that had gone on, Protestant mission. Where the bulk of Christians have been for a millennium. Only, please understand this, I just want to emphasize and I'll come back to it again, that Christianity in the West is about 1,000 years old and now about 1,200 years old. You go back to Germany and you find out when they were converted to Christianity. Go back to Scandinavia, 1100, 1200s. So it's not automatically that the, the Europe was Christians. You know, this is this is the way the assumption goes. It's 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 part of Europe was, not all of Europe was, and part of Europe is Islam, Muslims. As I keep talking about, Spain was for 800 years under the Muslim. So all these have to be relooked when we talk about Christianity. So there was 67 percent. 
Today, only about a quarter of all Christians live in Europe, 24%. From 67% of Christianity to 24% of Christianity. More than a third live in America, which is 37%. A quarter live in Sub-Saharan Africa, 24%. And about eight in Asia and Pacific, 13%. With this small, what this small fact hide is that though Europe and America still have a majority Christian population of 63%, that share is much lower than it was in 1910 when it was 93% of the people who live there. In Europe, the proportion has dropped from 95 to 76 and in America from 96 to 86% because the population of other religions have grown in these areas. Not only the population, has, but the percentage has gone. So... Uh, Christianity has grown enormously in sub-Saharan Africa and the Asia and Pacific region, where there are relatively few Christians at the beginning of the, relatively few Christians in the 20th century. The share of the population that is Christian in sub-Saharan Africa climbed from 9% in 1910 to 63% in 2010, from 9 to 63%. That's a growth in sub-Saharan Africa. While in Asia Pacific region, it rose from 3 to 7% because of the contesting religions. Christianity today, like a century ago, is truly a global faith. In 1910, it was not. So that, and I'm going to rest now this. Today, we are therefore forced into asking serious questions and must search for ways of doing theology. We deal with these realities very seriously. And as part of this core theological values rather than the tertiary element to be tackled after we have sorted our minuties of confessional, doctrinal, orthodox borders. In the old days, you talked about other religion after you've done all your theological work. Today, you can't do theology without talking about these things. And that's where the problem I had when we were talking about the old days of liberation theology, it never dealt with other religion. It dealt with the poverty and intra-Christian discourse. Today, you cannot do liberation theology without dealing with other religions, other cultures, and other communities. And what is their dislocations? And I'm saying that's what the change has occurred in this theological field. So let me go through casually. Though the concept of global seems simple enough, it is much more complex than the surface of the word seems to convey. We have ha had a changing concept of the world global and globality. Those of you who remember the second 17th century, the first thing that happened in a modern scientific period was all of a sudden the world was not the center. So we moved from a teriocentric or geocentric to a heliocentric universe. All of a sudden the sun was the center and that changed the character of how we perceived our world. The world was no longer four square and did not have a peg tent which religion had claimed, it was round. <laughs> we discover. So this, this concept of globe has been changing over time and it's not as simple as people pretend it to be. I still remember, and I, those of us who did missiology had to listen to, there was a man by the name of John R. Mott. How many people know John R. Mott's name? You all know him. He's the guy who founded YMCA. <laughs> That's why I bring his name. He's the guy who founded YMCA, a young man, Christian association. People don't tell you that there's a C in there. <laughs> right in the middle of this. He made a statement in 1910. And the statement said, the Christianization of the world in our generation. I, I, please put his Google his name and that top theme will come out. And that was the theme that moved. He was one of the founders of the 1910 Edinburgh. So they had a perception of the world that all that needed was our intervention into this world and the world will become Christian. Religion has not died, which was the Spencer, Comte, all those people arguing that the world is going to become totally secular. So they were arguing in 1800s. Mott was arguing in the beginning of the 20th century. One was arguing the Christianization of the world. The other was saying the secularization of the world. And epistemologically, university people said the secularization of the world. And the missiological people, the Christianization of the world. But they both had a concept of a world. You understand? And those worlds were changing worlds, right? Think of it for in Muslim tradition, these words, right? Go to the end of China, you know, oh, way out there if you have to gain knowledge. So the worlds are changing. World is not as simple a word as the words seem to suggest. We have also had what Heidegger called the world at hand. Not just the world. Nix nua the, 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 the welt of a world in hand. The one that influences me is my world. The Nietzsche's statement that we live in a, in a, 
uh, umge grand's world horizon is not something i make by a vantage point we live a horizon world we live in it we are moved by it we are created by it so the it, it's very interesting america has a very interesting concept of world those of you who lived in america you know that they have a world series of baseball and the world series of baseball basically involve a game between boston and new york <laughs> and they they have the gall to call it world series. i get very angry because i said who gave you the right to call it world you know what i mean every year we all watch world series seven games if you live in america i don't i don't know how many of you have lived in america it, it really appalls me that they could call it world series you know at least in the world cup in cricket all at least there are 13 14 nations playing right and they're all continents represented but this is just american so so it is who determines the character of the world determines the character of the globality and so don't don't take a simple word you ask me a question i'm very suspicious of terms so i ask you know everybody wants to now use a word in in politics and you are farid i'm talking to you farid because you and i have been part of this discourse everybody is now finding three words they use everybody wants to provide you windows of opportunity right have you heard every politician anywhere in the world and i said why are you not providing doors of opportunity who comes through the windows but thieves <laughs> look at the metaphors we use so everybody tells you oh we will provide you windows of opportunity to the poor people we provide windows i said no 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 don't talk about windows provide doors of opportunity so they don't classify them as thieves when they come into your house because only thieves come to the windows then they say safety nets everybody is into provision of safety net for the poor haven't you heard oh we'll provide safety net you need safety net not when you walk on the ground you don't need safety nets you only need safety net if you are walking on a tight rope so what are they expecting the poor so they're walking on the tight rope and then we'll put a safety net i said let them walk on the ground don't restrict their walking on the ground let them see how you do with your economics the third one they use is when the tide will rise all boats will rise i said yeah but a dinghy will be a dinghy and oil tanker will be a oil tanker they will all be at the same height 20 feet above but you're not changing the status in the ship and i'm saying all these metaphoricities we use for world are all exactly on the same ground we have to be suspiciously looking at how these words are articulated again i bring you my suspicion <laughs> so and i'm going to now do the what i'm doing there is a word word which ecumenics all use and people like my my colleague ernst konradi the word is ecumene the greek word ecumene comes from the word house house was both a negative term in in greek political theory and a positive term house was a place where people lived in coercion somebody had to cook somebody had to make food somebody had to go and work in a field somebody had so that was a negative oikos was a negative place and it was not polis polis is where those who had overcome the coercion of need could participate and it was obviously the men <laughs> because a woman was reminded monthly of a coercion of need where a man was not so therefore they can be in polis so polis was the ultimate goal of being hoi poli the people of the city right as compared to the slaves and women who were lived in the oikos and this is incredible statement when you think about it so it's a negative term oikos then all of a sudden it gets ex- exaggerated to include cultural values so now oikomene means those who have the same culture as we do because what is the opposite of oikomene the greek word is barbaros and who is the barbaros for the the mediterranean world anybody not of the peronies was a barbaros therefore the roman therefore the question comes in were romans not barbaros and as a matter of fact the greeks called the romans barbaros so the, don't, don't don't take this world council of churches language that we all use with impunity oh i come in means all in it was never meant to be all inclusive it is my world compared to your world it is the us and them and the them is always inferior and that's the word oikumene and you, you since you are a biblical person that's the context of that word 
And when you become a household of God, all of a sudden you're taken away from the us and them. So then the word gets changed to koinonia. Umma. <laughs> exactly the same word. That this is no longer an ethnically determined oikomene. It is now determined by the fact of Christ. And you are koinonia of that community in which the color lines, the class lines, all that get blurred because of the faithfulness. The umma become a transcendent identity marker. So that's the word koinonia becomes. Now I, I want to see the World Council, why they did not use the word koinonia when they used the word oikomene. Because in 1948, two things had happened. One, that the most civilized European group had murdered six million people. And it had put into question the very idea of the rational world. We who were the bearers of rationality, the Vernunftlichkeiten, the, the, the rationalität, had murdered six million people for a simple fact that they were Jews. It was a European moment of reflecting confessionally on what happened. Therefore, 1948 produced UN, 1948 produced Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948 World Council of Churches. All of these were primarily European quests with an American input because this was part of the Marshall Plan. Right? And I can show you the data. I mean, this is not, I, in this I've got footnotes for you to look at. And this changed and the one Indian who was there by the name of M.M. Thomas, you might know his name. M.M. Thomas was a theologian. He was there at Edinburgh, sorry, at, uh, at Amsterdam. And inside the Amsterdam, there's a fight that takes place between Barthians on the one side. I just want to give you this detail because the Eastern European did not want to participate in the ecumenical movement. So they started institutes and council of peace. Hormatka, Josef Hormatka, those of you who know that name, actually started that process there. And they had get a fight with Nibhorians who are there promoting. And you know who's the one of the speaker? John Foster Dulles. You know who John Foster Dulles is? He's one of the he's one he, 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 and Hormatka gets up on the floor of the World Council and says, This is American hegemony and not an ecumenical movement. So these are not these are the fight we hide because we don't want to bring the dirty linens of that period out in the public. But I think till we bring them out, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free, not hiding the truth. So I just wanted to we have uh, the problem that you get in a lot of the current, current debates is that we are actually confusing the ultimate, and if I can use a Paul Tillich language, the ultimate concern and the penultimate concern. Is Christianity going to talk about the ultimate concerns or other ideas that, you know, because I am a Barthian, therefore I have a better place near God, and you are a Tilikian, and you know you are not a good people, or you are a Brunerian. The schooling that comes out actually determines your loyalties and everything else. And I think we are, we are actually, let me just quickly go through this, then I, I can come to the theological part. And those of you who want to, I've got this paper almost written, and you can have a copy of it. So you can make all, all this, I've put some of them in the blank pages for you. Let me begin. Given the task at hand, we can either begin this discourse. I mean, this, this is the pro position we are in now. We can begin this discourse by vilifying the other, whom we are wont to call all kinds of names. And the vilification is a part of identity markers process for a people. If I am somebody and he is not that, I must put him down. The, 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 the problem that identity markers are, it always not only excludes, but vilifies. Not necessary, but it is done. Because I'm a man, I must put down women. <laughs> rather, than, rather than say, well, no, without women, men are not complete. I'm a born of a woman. How can a woman be less than me? I mean, it's a simple biological question. Every one of us is born of a woman. How can a woman be less than me? I couldn't have been born without her. <laughs> you know, so, but yet we have been able to do this over years and years of things. So we begin with the assumption, we call names, and we begin the notion of absolute worthlessness of the other. And I want to begin with the notion that Christianity begins with the presumption of total worthfulness of the other. And I'm not being romantic either. It begins with the assumption that everybody has been worth 
of God's love. And I use the word love again here. But not love just in a cheap way. Love to the point of the cross. So the, to use the Bonhoeffian language, it's a costly love. It's a costly love because somebody had to die to get it done. So that it begins with the assumptions of worthfulness. And I can quote a number of passages in the Bible, including John 3.16, the one that is loved greatly. For God so loved the world, didn't say God so loved the Christians. <laughs> or white people, or brown people, or black people. God so loved the cosmos. Everybody was given equal worth at that point. And God was in Christ reconciling the cosmos unto himself, not the Christians. And then the text goes. You know what the text is? Not counting their transgression. Third person plural. Giving unto us a ministry of reconciliation, first person. Everybody's sin has been taken care of. Now, this is a Christian way. You don't have to believe it. But that is the assumption that has to be made if a Christian wants to begin talking about people who are not part of their community. You must begin with the total worthfulness of the other. At no point is anybody, either Christ did not die for the world, then the, my faith is in vain. Or if they, this did happen, then the worthfulness has to be affirmed, confirmed, and become the foundational point of Christian faith and understanding. And that's the question I want to be. Therefore, there is no vilification of Farid because he's not a Christian. I have to say Farid is as much in part of God's grace as I am. I just happen to know about it. And that changes the whole understanding of these conversion stories and all that, that I don't need to do conversion as a requirement. I need to love as a requirement. And this is, again, I'm rushing through this, and those of you who want, again. So if you develop a theology in the context of other religion, I think we have to begin with, with the notion that it must be remembered that Islam has been the West's oldest, and I'm going to say this, and you will come back to me in a minute, oldest, nearest, and the largest neighbor since its emergence in the 6th century. Islam has not been out there. Islam has been at the very core of Christian experiencing itself. Even more than Judaism. Even though the borrowing was done from Judaism. But Jews did not have power. Islam did. <laughs> Whenever we want after the third century, we just beat on them. You know, after Constantine's conversion. The first thing Constantine does after the conversion is beat on the Jews. Islam has not been so easily beatable. And so it has impinged upon us and our experiencing of ourselves much more than we would like to admit. So Christ Christendom and Islam have lived side by side now for over 1400 years. And with the exception of Judaism, Islam is the only religion to co coexist for so long with Christianity. And you know what we did to the Jews as Christians. You remember Hitler was quoting Luther when he was doing this. He was quoting on the Judenfrage. For about a millennium, all the other world religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Shintoism, were thousand miles away. They were in either India or they were in China. And we had no real encounter except some trading relationship with them. Islam was as near to us as Spain, Pyrenees, Sicily, the Balkans, the Asia Minor, and all the places which are mentioned in the Bible. So think about Corinthians, think about Ephesians, think about Galatians, and tell me where they exist. The churches that were addressed in the book of Revelation were now all under the Turkish rules, under the Seljuks and then the Ottoman. They already experienced what the book said would happen. So there's no, no longer churches in this area. Islam emergence in the 6th century and in the fact that it quickly became a major religion and political player, first in its region and then shortly thereafter on the world stage, was a serious challenge to the existing religions of the area, particular Judaism and Christianity. How can another religion be successful if you have something to give right? If you have something. something right to give. You get it? I mean, it's a question to me. What is our failure that Islam was so successful? You know, of course, the Christian answer very quickly, but, you know, it was power of the devil. 
If, we, if, if that was the case, you know, the Jews would turn around and say to us, of course it was the power of devil that Christians became more powerful. I mean, that logic can be applied back and forth all over the place. But the simple question remained that Islam came 600 years after Christianity and it succeeded in the immediate 100 years had taken over all the lands which belonged to Christian. And so the question must be asked, what was the lacuna in Christianity, not what is the success of it? Then it is the question of the power of the soul. Right? Yeah, well, you Just know. <laughs> the question of the lacuna, anyway. No, but I mean, and I'm, I, I, again, and I have a very different take on just the power of the soul. Because I look at the, the, the actual figures. Because Christians had killed Christians for 150 years in that area. Remember, the, uh, the, the Constantinian church and the Roman church had killed the Monophysites, the, the Nestorians, and wiped them out. They laid a jizya on the Christians who were not Constantinian Christians, which means after Nicaea, 27%. Muslims only put 3%. That's a fact. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> they took away their food. We, we have actual documents from the monasteries. That's why I'm saying I'm, I'm looking at the Christian monasteries. And these were Nestorian monasteries and monophysitic monasteries, Jacobite monasteries. This area was heterodox area where Islam came. It was not the orthodox area. Please understand this. And they were actually suffering in the hand of the orthodox Christianity after Nicaea, after 325. We, we, this we know from Christian sources. So was Islamic, Islam carrying more heavy swords as compared to the Christian swords? Or was it putting more tax? I mean, what is the reason for that conversion? Because they were monophysites. For them, Islam appealed. If they were Trinitarian, that may not work as easily. But because they were monophysites, and most of these monophysites had problem with this dual nature of Jesus. That, so that's why I'm saying I'm giving you Christian answers on this side. So why is it that the, Islam claimed to be the total continuity with these two religions, and saw itself as an abrogation of these religions, especially Christianity, which Islam argued had already played a similar, if not an identical role, what we were doing vis-a-vis -vis the Jew. If they had borrowed a book from the Jew and reinterpreted it, so Isaiah 53, 54 was referring to, to Jesus, suffering servant stories were referring to Jesus. Jews, Jews say, sorry for my language, get the hell out of here. It refers to us, it doesn't refer to you. So when Christian turned around and said to the Muslim that you have taken our text and work, and I said, they have not done anything different than what we did. <laughs> so, so, so don't accuse one for doing your own fault. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I am a Christian. I'm not talking about this in defense of Islam. But I am asking for some truth and veracity in our discourse. And without that, I don't think we can get anywhere at, at anymore. So this was a huge challenge to Christianity because Islam is the only major world religion that claims to be a successor to these two. Okay, 15? Three, okay. Oh, then I Christian th theologians have long understood Ju Judaism and they use an actual language in Latin called Prapatorio Evangelica. That Judaism came in preparation for Christ. Muslims turn that around and they say Christianity came as a preparation for Islam. So Prapatorio Evangelica to Preparatorio Islamica. And so it actually remains within that monotheistic traditions, which borrows and changes, borrows and changes, because the change and continuity have to be maintained in the same dialectical pattern. That's what I began my talk on. And Islam reminds us of the dialectic of the continuity of change of these, th these traditions. And what we have done with them is, and the last point I'm going to make, the largest single hermeneutic of the biblical text especially the New Testament. One interpretation is in the Quran. All Muslims believe it. Talk to 10 Christians and they will give you 10 interpretations of those texts. Muslims give you a homogenized interpretation. So the largest hermeneutical position of the Christian textuality comes from Islam and not from us. You and I will fight because you are reformed and I'm a Lutheran. <laughs> you know, do we take the first use of the law, the second use of the law, the third use of the law, and then we build books and libraries out of these things. Islam says, this is what it is, and a Muslim believes it. So in fact, they interpret the Quran, Bible, the New Testament, in a very peculiar way. You may disagree with it, but it's the most structured hermeneutical position, vis-a-vis -vis the person of Christ, vis-a-vis -vis the virgin birth, vis-a-vis -vis the cross, 
whether it did happen or not, vis-a-vis -vis the resurrection, whether it happened or not, but there's a consistent argument. And so, in, in fact, you, if you're going to do Christianity today, you'll have to look at the Islamic hermeneutics of those Christian texts as a part of the dialogical process. And I use the word dialogue, not in some wishy-washy softness. The Greek word dialogos has got a preposition in front of it. It's D-I-A, it's not D-I-L-O-G-U-E. What we say is dialogue means two people talking. It's not never been the case. It means you bring your logos into this discussion. Dia, go through your logos and talk about the issue of justice. Go through your logos, talk about, and it does not mean two people talking. And I think what Islam is doing, so the opposite of dialogue is forcing us, is not monologue. Because it's not a numerical prefix, it is metalogue. When you escape your logos, you'd get into dialogue. And that means you have no more. I'm not asking anybody to be soft and nice. About I want Christians to keep what is innately Christian, what is native to it. I just don't want them to be provincial. <laughs> because immediately say, well, you can't understand this. So if you look at what's happening in the world Christianity today, there are three basic movements in that the last two minutes. Have <coughs> One, there is a multi-religiousness built into the Christian theological task at the core. Not, not as a tertiary act. Two, the recognition that Christianity encounters other reality than enlightenment and secularity. And that no Christian witness is now complete without taking that experience of multi-religiosity and plurality into its own context. And West, if it has to do theology now, will have to take that because it's now living in their own backyard. And the third point is at the end of these struggles, there has to be a pervasive understanding of what is justice. So we must begin with Plato's Republic Dialogue. What is justice for you? What is justice for you? And that as we discuss this, we begin to reinterpret our own tradition differently than we did before. So it's actually enhancing your own faithfulness to issues of human existence together, rather than converting somebody to my position. It, it may entail completely new interpretation than I did as a Christian before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.